Welcome, all of you, to our Public Historical Society second Thursday event. Uh, we've been doing this now for almost a year, I think, and uh, this was a wonderful idea, by the way, that John Grafer came up with, and that's how we got started. And, uh, I can't say enough good things about our relationship with, with John. He's terribly missed. Oh, I'm Jim Milliken. I'm chairman of the Concord Historical Society. And, uh, and I have uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, folks at these meetings. But as I look around the room, I an executive privilege or whatever you call that, uh, I think there's a very notable person in the room. <laughs> Particularly, there's a number of them. <laughs> but uh, how about saying hello to our soon to be neighbors? <laughs> You don't need a speech, and you did a heck of a job. <laughs> I'll stop. Mark Travis is going to start, and please help me welcome him. Thanks, Jim. I'm afraid I've left Steve shirtless, shirtless, oh, shirtless, shirtless, a little more than half of the story to tell, but that he and I will work that out in the time between now and when he speaks. Um, I'm grateful to see so many people here and, and for the opportunity to, to uh, tell you a bit about John Wynant tonight. Um, although I'm here to talk about the remarkable John Wynant, I want to begin by saying a few words about the remarkable Mike Pride, uh, the Monitor's longtime editor who died in April. Um, back in 1980, when I toured New Hampshire's newspapers looking for a reporter's job with no experience and college essays for my writing samples, Mike was the only editor to give me a chance. It's no exaggeration to say that in the decades that followed, only my wife Brenda shaped me more than Mike did. Following the emergence of his blood cancer four years ago, I watched in amazement as Mike threw himself into writing as never before. He brought two books to publication, including the story of Concord Civil War nurse Harriet Dame, and finished <clears throat> the manuscript last fall for a third book, a poetry memoir that'll come out in the spring. Then, faced with the unacceptable prospect of nothing to do, um, Mike asked me if I'd join him in one more project, a biography of John Winant. Um, knowing Mike thrived on purpose, I agreed on the spot. And often in working on books like Mike and I have worked on, books about the past, the challenge is finding material. In the case of John Winant, the challenge is sifting material. Um, his papers, <clears throat> his papers alone, mind you, fill 333 boxes at the FDR library in Hyde Park. So. Undaunted, um, Mike and I divided the work and dove in. Mike's initial focus was Wynant's emergence as an international figure just before and during World War II. Mine was Wynant's emergence as a New Hampshire political figure in the years after World War I. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to share uh, what I learned about John Wynant with you tonight and to begin by acknowledging my life's great friend, um, Mike Pride. So, John Wynant, <clears throat> I'd like you to picture a secret meeting attended by 30 to 40 men in September of 1923 here at the Hillside Inn on the shore of Newfound Lake. The man behind the meeting was former Governor Robert Perkins Bass. You're going to hear a lot of names you recognize tonight. The architect of the brief ascendance of the Republican Party's progressive wing in New Hampshire in the early 1900s. Over four years, they enacted campaign spending reforms and the direct primary, created what's now the Public Service Commission, and curtailed the B&M Railroad's political influence. But when the progressive icon Teddy Roosevelt split from the Republicans to run for president as an independent in 1912, Bass aligned the state's progressives with him. That splintered the state Republican Party and opened the door to a rare Democratic turn in office. 
New Hampshire progressives had been shunned by party regulars and reduced to irrelevance ever since. Bass brought a bushel basket of apples to the meeting, which began around an outside fire. Dinner followed. The men felt renewed promise in the crisp air. By the time they left, they had plotted a comeback. They would run a sacrificial lamb for governor in, 19, in the 1924 Republican primary, reactivating their organization and setting the stage for their real target, the leader of the Republican regulars, U.S. Senator George Moses, when he came up for re-election in 1926. But who would be the lamb? After considering men more widely known, they settled on John Gilbert Winant, a World War I pilot and former state senator from Concord. The pros? Winant was rich. He had time, energy, and ambition. He was young and devoted to the progressive cause. The cons? Aside from not being widely known, one stood out. On stage, in front of an audience, he struggled painfully for words. Here's how John R. McLean, a Concord lawyer and the second architect of the secret meeting, put it. Gill was never a good speaker. He was, in fact, a very wretched speaker. At this time, he was hopeless. This is a friend, mind you. <laughs> On a platform, you just ached and wept almost with Gill. <laughs> Promising. The meeting's outcome was no accident. Bass had been laying the groundwork for Winant for months. And as he remembered it, the result was an understanding, an explicit understanding between the two men. Winant would run and most likely lose in the Republican primary of 1924. After all, his primary opponent was the formidable Frank Knox, owner and editor of the Manchester Union, which we know today as the union leader. But invigorated by Winant's challenge, the progressives would run him for governor again in 1926, and Bass would take on Moses. Bass, McLean, and Winant joined in writing a press release announcing Winant's candidacy. The race was on, and the result, the response rather, was underwhelming. <laughs> Captain John Winant of Concord, World War aviator, has announced that he will be candidate for governor at the primary, the editor of the Keene Sentinel wrote. Captain Winant is an extremely likable chap, and he's done quite well over in Concord but just now he appears to be taking a long chance on having his political ship wrecked in a tailspin. Now, having framed the challenge, I'd like to step back and tell you a bit about what led John Winant to this moment. He was born into a wealthy family in 1889, baptized in an Episcopal church in New York City, and in due time, shipped off to St. Paul's School in Concord. Winant, or Gill, as his friends called him, graduated in 1908. He was a poor student, but he went on to form a lasting relationship with the rector of St. Paul's, Dr. Samuel Drury, an admirer of Abraham Lincoln and an advocate for social justice. I think it's reasonable to say that Drury became a father figure to Winant and St. Paul's his surrogate family. In 1913, when Winant dropped out of Princeton, Drury hired him to teach history at St. Paul's. <laughs> Has that ever happened since? I don't know. <laughs> Wynant connected with New Hampshire progressives the next year when the novelist Winston Churchill, an early progressive leader, came to St. Paul's to give a talk. Afterward, Wynant approached him. Impressed, Churchill introduced him by letter to Robert Bass, writing, I think it's possible that I have found the young man that sounds like a reference to Winant's political promise, but they were looking for administrative help. <laughs> Already though, Winant was more ambitious than that and eager for public service. In 1916, at the age of 27, he ran for a District 7 house seat in Concord. He faced an uphill challenge, literally. St. Paul's is not quite the jumping off place for New Hampshire politics, McLean remarked. District 7 encompassed St. Paul's with its staff and employees, then ran along the edge of the city down to the railroad shops in the South End. Winant went to work. 
I don't suppose that a master at St. Paul's school had ever rung a doorbell in the car shop district, <laughs> McLean said. Winant must have rung them all. There were four candidates for three seats, and Winant got the most votes. In the 1917 session, Winant aligned himself with what became his signature issue, introducing legislation, the first, to reduce the work week for women and children in New Hampshire industries from 54 hours to 48. After he spoke on the issue on the floor of the House, his proposal was rejected in a vote, vote so one-sided, the clerk did not bother to record the tally. <coughs> in April of 1917, as the session drew to a close, the United States entered the World War. Wynant booked passage on a ship to Europe, made his way to Paris, and presented himself at the nascent Army, American Army headquarters there. They were probably surprised to see him. He enlisted as a private and joined a handful of Americans already overseas, volunteer ambulance drivers mainly, at a French military flight school. After graduating, he was commissioned a first lieutenant and joined the first American squadron of observation planes deployed to the front as a pilot. There, he met another young pilot who became his close friend and business partner, Arthur Coyle. It turned out that Coyle was from Concord too, although they didn't meet until circumstances delivered them both to the front in France. Wynant was not a gifted pilot. He wasn't particularly skillful about the actual flying of the airplane, <laughs> Coyle said, but he showed great courage volunteering repeatedly for hazardous missions. He spent more on uniforms than any other pilot, Coyle remembered, and got them dirtier too. Wynant was the only pilot in the squadron who joined the, the mechanics in working on his own plane. He ended the war as a captain. After he got out, Wynant came back to Concord, and the elements of his life fell into place. He returned to St. Paul's and became vice rector. Are there any more chairs? Yeah, you can get them. Thank you. Um, in 1919, he married a wealthy young woman from New Jersey named Constance Rivington Russell who was 10 years younger than him. They had three children in six years, a daughter followed by two sons. And when Arthur Coyle got in touch with a business opportunity, Wynant listened, and together they struck oil. Having finished his military service in Texas and with no other plans, Coyle decided to get some experience in the oil fields. He and Wynant had been out of contact for two years when Coyle wired in the spring of 1921 with an urgent proposal that they go in together on a promising new oil field. It was a boom or bust business. Wynant put up almost all the money. And that fall, Coyle delivered the year's most productive strike in Texas at 16,000 barrels a day. After running the operation for just two months, they sold out. In less than a year, they turned an $85,000 investment into a $750,000 profit. McLean was their lawyer, and Wynant was suddenly, in his own right, a very wealthy man. In many respects, he behaved like a very wealthy man. He and Constance moved from St. Paul's housing to 274 Pleasant Street, what's now the Unitarian Church, but at that time, this expansive house. Wynant indulged his interests, Arabian horses, art, art featuring Arabian horses, <laughs> Lincoln memorabilia. He and Constance registered a series of luxury cars, a Stutz, Packards, a Rolls-Royce Cabriolet. He formed, formed the Concord Coil Oil Company with Arthur in 1922 and pursued new strikes. He formed a real estate company and bought the Patriot Building in downtown Concord. He and a Vermonter named Frank Langley bought two Concord newspapers, the Patriot and the Monitor, consolidated them, and brought Frank's son, James Langley, to town as editor. Wynant's empathy for those less fortunate and his personal generosity, qualities for which he is well remembered, also marked these years. Concord faced a housing shortage. Wynant bought several lots in the South End, 
and proceeded to build three modest single-family homes there. These houses, I believe, though I can't be sure, intending to help alleviate the shortage by selling them at cost. In fact, I believe he sold them at a loss. Their first owners included a machinist and a clerk in a downtown fish market. A great weakness in wine emerged in these years too, the habit of trusting too quickly and investing too readily. Once, while riding on a train to New York City, Winant encountered two old friends who had founded an electric car company. A year later, it was not Tesla. A year later, one wrote to confess, oh, I'm sorry, by the time he got off the train, Winant had agreed to lend them $5,000 on a handshake. A year later, one wrote to confess that they could not pay it back. Winant backed several doomed ventures in New Hampshire including lumber and road building companies, and appeared in at least one case to have invested Constance's money as well as his own, a dairy in Concord intended to demonstrate the potential of a sheer cattle. It was run by graduates of UNH's agriculture program who brought no capital or experience to the venture. The initial spectacular success was to some extent unfortunate, McLean said of the first oil strike. As a fellow who was very, very anxious to help young people especially get established, he lent an ear to plans that weren't very well worked out. Through all this, Wynant's devotion to the greater good persisted. In 1920, he was elected to a seat in the state senate. And in 1922, he returned to the house. Wynant's senate campaign brochure featured his photo in a private's uniform on the cover and recommendations from Teddy Roosevelt, Drury, and Coyle inside, along with a letter he wrote to voters highlighting his record. I would very much appreciate a promotion in the field of public service, he closed. So there you have it, the John Wynant who agreed to make an unlikely run for governor in 1924. Along with the pros and one, the one big con I've already described, Wynant brought subtle advantages to the race too. He had become well known to the members of the House and Senate, McLean said, which meant that he had acquaintances and friends in every nook and cranny of the state. And I think it's fair to say that up to that time, he was considered an independent Republican. By that, McLean meant that Wynant was not accepted by the inner circles of the party, but neither was he seen as someone who might challenge their dominance. He was not, at least not yet, a threat the, regu the regulars took seriously. Having announced his candidacy in a brief statement on September 28, 1923, Wynant followed with an eight-page pamphlet detailing his stands on the issues a month later. It's a wall of words without a single image in it. I am keenly aware that I am an unknown figure to many of the people of this state, it began. I hope that for you, before you pledge your support, you will, at least, give me the opportunity of making your acquaintance. He made no effort to shade his views. I am frankly a liberal Republican, he wrote. Our task as Republicans is to strive for social and industrial justice achieved through the genuine rule of the people. From there he went issue by issue, agriculture, industry, under which he addressed the 48 hour work week, conservation, taxation, the economy, education, state institutions, and prohibition where he called for vigorous enforcement. For the most part, though, the first phase of the Wynant candidacy was an underground operation. Like the secret meeting, it was in orchestrated by Robert Bass, who set out to reactivate and enlarge the old progressive network. To people he knew, he wrote asking for more names, names of like-minded men, names of clergy, names of businessmen, names of women with an interest in politics. Remember women had just secured the right to vote. Bass relied on a young Norris Cotton for guidance on lawmakers who might back Wynant and got a candid rundown. A good old soul who never thinks, Cotton said of one, inclined to be straight Republican but sore at Moses, he said of another. With names in hand, Bass wrote dozens of letters beginning <clears throat> like this one to Stanley Abbott of Wilton. 
I am dropping you this line to tell you something about my friend, Mr. Winant of Concord, who is a candidate for the Republican nomination for governor. Winant, he wrote, would attract young voters, veterans, and even Democratic voters in the cities. But best of all, Bass closed, he is a clean, honest man of highest character whom we can all be proud to support. Won't you drop me a line about the political situation in your neighborhood? And if you feel so inclined, do anything you can to help Winant's candidacy. Winant followed Bass's letters with one of his own, asking for an opportunity to meet, often in the company of an influential local suggested by Bass. This approach soon revealed that Winant had possessed what Bass called an exceptional ability to enlist enthusiastic support from men and women with whom he came in personal contact. Hard as it might be to watch him speak, his difficulties seemed to strike listeners as an expression of sincerity. By February, Bass began to shift the tone of his correspondence. Winant, he wrote one potential ally, is getting assurance of support from different sections of the state which are very encouraging. His candidacy is, I believe, gaining strength gradually but surely. At first, Knox remained complacent. I note that you have definitely committed to monitor to the cause of Winant, which is exactly what I expected and a fact which I thoroughly understand, he wrote to James Langley, the monitor editor, in January of 1924. Winant, he added, has got an immense job on his hands if he is going to make even a creditable showing in this fight. But he challenged Winant to abide by the state's $1,000 campaign spending limit, saying he would do the same. This was an attempt to hamstring his progressive opponent with a law that the reformers had put in place a decade before. Winant replied by saying the law was meant to inhibit a candidate's personal spending, but not the campaign as a whole, and that his campaign would spend what was required to counter Knox's control of the only statewide newspaper. In March, Winant actually boarded a steamship with his family for a vacation in Europe. But after his return in early April, the campaign burst into public view. Winant spent heavily on newspaper advertising and mailings across the state. Stiles Bridges, then like Norris Cotton, a young activist, another name surely familiar to you, developed a list of 11 speakers, two of them women, who would take the stage on Winant's behalf at an extensive series of campaign events. The meetings or rallies put on shall be cooperative, Bridges wrote, with both men and women participating. Remarks were to be tailored to their audience. The 48-hour law, Bridges wrote, is to be emphasized only in labor centers. Everything was orchestrated to peak on election day. Knox began to throw elbows, accusing Winant of trying to buy the office. Bridges turned to McLean for guidance on how to counter the attack. I should approach the matter, McLean wrote, from the point of view that Knox is seeking to prevent Winant from having a fair opportunity to put before the public some account of his character and personality and the principles for which he stands. As a clincher, he advised, speakers should say that when Wyden announced his candidacy and then the makeup of his state committee, he was denied news space in the union and forced to pay $240 for each of two advertisements to get the information in the paper. Langley and the Monitor, meanwhile, were squarely in Winant's corner. Over the last week of the campaign, <coughs> Winant was scheduled to speak all day, uh, scheduled all day and into the evening, attending three to five rallies every night. Winant's backers pulled out all the stops for a climactic rally at the City Hall in Manchester on Knox home turf days before the election. The crowd packed the hall, and hundreds who couldn't get in lingered outside. The rally was an innovation in Manchester politics, the union reported, for combined with the speaking was an excellent band concert and singing by a quartet from out of town. <laughs> Bass and Winant addressed the crowd. There was tremendous enthusiasm, said McLean, who presided, the story of which spread up and down the street. This was before the days of polling, but that did not stop newspapers from predicting election outcomes. On the morning of the election, September 2nd, the lead stories in the union anticipated a large turnout, reported that every Manchester alderman expected Knox to carry the city handily, and asserted that Knox would carry the state by a large margin. Instead, 
why it triumphed. And Concord was the single biggest reason why. He carried the state by 2,500 votes and Concord by 2,000. Knox won Manchester, but by only 370 votes. Both men carried five counties, but Wynant's advantage in Merrimack County made the difference. Victory in November came more easily. The Democratic candidate was incumbent Fred Brown, who was running against tradition. No New Hampshire governor had served more than a single term since two-year terms were enacted in 1880. The popular Republican, that's because they were for years, the office was seen as an honor, you know, someone earned for a lifetime of service and um, uh, then passed it on to another deserving person. <clears throat> the popular Republican president, Calvin Coolidge, figured to boost the entire ticket. The Democrats assailed Winant for his spending, $18,000 in the primary alone, as it turned out, the most ever and six times the governor's salary. <laughs> Winant's largest donor, any guesses? Constance. <laughs> at $5,500, followed by Arthur Coyle and another friend and business partner, State Senator Benjamin Orr, who gave $3,000 apiece. The campaign spent nearly $10,000 on literature, mailings, newspaper ads, and posters no TV, as well as almost $1,900 to transport voters to the polls on primary day. Perhaps those disclosures took a toll, but it wasn't nearly enough. Although Winant trailed Coolidge on the, on the ticket by 12,000 votes, he still carried the state by a similar margin. Winant kept a number of the congratulatory letters that followed, many from St. Paul's friends and military comrades. Some predicted great things ahead. It's a long road to the presidential chair, wrote Harry Laughlin of Boston, but to be governor at 35 is starting better than most. As lawmakers settled in their seats for John Winant's inaugural on January 8, 1925, Concord's District 7 Republican Club, his home district, presented him with a basket of roses. Constant Winant watched from the gallery alongside her sister and brother-in-law who were from Newport, Rhode Island and a friend from New York City. The ceremony that followed was noted in the newspapers for its business-like simplicity. Winant's speech delivered in short matter-of-fact sentences amounted to a legislative to-do list encompassing 30 distinct proposals. What mattered most to Winant were two labor measures, the 48-hour work week and ratification of a federal constitutional amendment to ban child labor. The first great challenge of his term was upon him within a week, a, a hearing before the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission on a B&M railroad plan to abandon 400 miles of trunk lines in the state that were no longer profitable. The reason, that's 40% of their lines, the reason was a technological revolution as disruptive as the internet in our time. Guesses? Automobile. The automobile. In his inaugural, Wynant proposed a special counsel to make the case for preserving the lines. And in the meantime, he dispatched the state attorney general to Washington to plead for time. Bass had worked hard once again behind the scenes to ensure that the House Speaker and Senate President were friendly to Wynant's agenda. But the first legislative battle they faced was the work of party regulars, an effort to repeal the state's direct primary law. Wynant's campaign spending was at the heart of the anti-primary case, although his name wasn't mentioned. And when I shout now, it's because this is in all capitals in the Union Leader editorial. The man with a big campaign fund will win every time, the Union Leader said. The present primary law has become nothing but a rich man's plaything. Supporters of the law didn't mention Knox by name either, but Bridges dismissed the anti-primary crowd as professional politicians, defeated candidates, disappointed office seekers, and prospective candidates for office who have a personal or political record they do not care to submit to the people. After a decade in place, the primary had widespread support and the House killed the anti-primary bill by a vote of better than two to one. The 48-hour work week, Wynant's signature issue, came to the fore next. 
Despite his election win, the odds were stacked against him. The Amiskeag Mills, at their height, the largest textile manufacturing facility in the world, faced stiff competition from southern mills and cheaper labor. When Amiskeag cut pay and increased hours in 1922, workers struck for the first time in company history. After nine months, unsuccessful, they grudgingly returned to work. The state's business interests were aligned against the 48-hour work week, and more surprisingly, so were the farmers, who feared higher costs and, in time, restrictions on farm labor, too. These two constituencies formed the pillars of the Republican Party. In the hours before the decisive vote, Wynett made his one session appearance before the House, pleading for passage. The bill failed, 198 to 153. Democrats overwhelmingly supported the bill, and Republicans overwhelmingly opposed it. The governor suffered a second major defeat in March when the House crushed ratification of the child labor amendment by a vote of 327 to 37. But these were the two great exceptions to what was otherwise, from Wynett's point of view, a successful session. By its conclusion at the end of April, lawmakers had passed 27 of the 30 proposals Wynant called for in his inaugural. His state budget passed with ease, largely because he devoted hours to scrutinizing the spending proposals by state department heads, often revising them downward, work that had always before fallen to a House committee. As a result of his labors, the committee recommended his budget after only two days of review. Lawmakers agreed with his proposal to devote a small but fixed percentage of state revenue to the University of New Hampshire, wouldn't they like that now, and bond work for a new dorm at the Keene Normal School. They appointed a study committee to consider consolidating state departments while raising pay for state workers. They raised the gas tax, shifting the burden of road maintenance to drivers. And they cut the poll tax from $3 to 2 They enacted an advertising program to market the state and changed the name of the school for the feeble-minded to the Laconia State School. All were aspects of Wynant's agenda. The session's most lasting contribution was the purchase of Franconia Notch, thus preserving, at least until nature had its way, the great stone face and establishing the state park. On the session's final day, the House and Senate resolved their differences over stiffer enforcement of prohibition dry laws by dropping a proposal to subject people who bought liquor to the same penalties as people who sold it. That was it. Wynant was only four months into his two-year term, and the legislature had gone home. Of course, for Wynant, the session wasn't all business. It never is. He led a delegation of 35 people from New Hampshire to President Coolidge's inaugural, riding in a car in the inaugural parade alongside Constance. In Concord, he presided over the governor's ball, the social centerpiece of the session. Festivities began with a reception for 800 people, lawmakers, families, state officers, employees, and wives in the state house, followed by a lunch on the third floor featuring salads, chicken patties, fancy ices and coffee, with music provided by an orchestra in the corridors. Two more receptions followed, one at the wine at home. The ball included dinner and dancing, with music provided by two orchestras, one for waltzes and the other for modern dancing. Wynant found time to pursue his own interests as well. The, shortly before the primary bill was voted on, he made, a front, he made front page news in the monitor for his purchase of a valuable Lincoln portrait. I believe it's this one, based on the description in the monitor and the name of the artist, William Morris Hunt. There's a record in Winant's papers saying he spent $3,270 to acquire this painting, which again is more than the governor's annual salary. So now, with lawmakers gone, what occupied the balance of Wynant's term? The B&M, for one thing. By and large, during his term, the state fought a successful delaying action, resulting in the closure of only 20 miles of track from Nashua into Massachusetts. A strike by Pennsylvania coal miners 
led to fears of an anthracite coal shortage in the winter of 1925-26. And under Wynant's direction, the state government explored lower grade alternatives for its own needs and, under Wynant's, and, um, and worked to ensure an adequate supply for the public. Ceremonial duties were endless, including opening the Sunset League season in Concord alongside Mayor Willis Flint. A typewritten note on the back of a piece of his stationery illustrates Winant's obsession with the details of state government. The Department of Agriculture has an inspector who checks butterfat at creameries, he wrote. And the Department of Weights and Measures sends an inspector to check, butter, uh, to check the scales at creameries. That work might well be done by one man, which would save, which would save labor and unnecessary travel expenses. Most notably, Winant opened his office to the people, seeing almost anyone who showed up there to press a concern. When Arthur Coyle arrived one day to discuss a business proposition, he found 30 to 40 people waiting to see the governor. Led in through a back entrance to Winant's office, he found his partner so distracted by the visitors that he left without discussing the proposition he had come to present. An example of the issues people brought to Winant is preserved in a letter from the town clerk of Ware <coughs> in the Winant papers relating to the state's rejection of a driver's license for a man named Fred Clement based on reports of his drinking. Clement's brother ran a large toy shop that employed many hands, the clerk wrote, and he needed Fred to drive the delivery truck. It will be very convenient if you could use your influence to secure him a license, the clerk wrote. I assure he is no more a drinking man than nine of 10 who have a license. <laughs> <laughs> there was, as well, an undercurrent of political intrigue running throughout Winant's term. Exactly who would run for what in 1926? It's hard to say when Wynant first had second thoughts about his understanding with Bass that Wynant would run for governor in 1926 and Bass for U.S. Senate. <clears throat> Maybe it was as early as Election Day in 1924 when Wynant won the governor's race two years ahead of schedule. I'll bet it was no later than January 10th, 1925, just a week into Wynant's term, when Republican Huntley Spaulding announced his candidacy for governor in the next election. Once progressive, now mainstream, Spaulding was a wealthy businessman, a noted philanthropist, and president of the State Board of Education. Winant had singled him out for praise in his inaugural. This, the union reported, is taken to mean that Mr. Spaulding will probably be supported by the Winant administration, and coupled with this is the report that Governor Winant may, if his administration is considered sexful, successful, be a candidate for senator in opposition to George H. Moses, present senior senator. Spaulding's announcement came months earlier than the norm, an early sign that the party regulars had no intention of being caught by surprise again. What followed was as awkward as watching Winant grope for words on stage. Despite entreaties from Bass, he wouldn't commit. <clears throat> maybe he'd run for governor, as they discussed but maybe he'd run for Senate instead. Bass met Winant at his house to discuss the situation on February 16th. I told him I had been much disturbed as I thought this matter over, Bass wrote. Winant remained noncommittal. McLean met with both of them three days later. It was perfectly evident that the conflicting desires of the two men must be worked out shortly, he remembered. He did his best. On the 23rd, he met with Winant. On March 13th, the Basses joined the McLeans for dinner, or discussions over dinner. Two days later, Wynant met again uh, with McLean. Circumstances suggest that Wynant settled on the initial understanding he'd run for a second term as governor, Bass for U.S. Senate, before the end of the session in April. But the delay and the tension left both men at a disadvantage. Now Wynant was running against the one-term tradition, as well as Huntley Spaulding. He compounded that challenge by failing to build his own network of support. Rather than rewarding his most ardent backers with state jobs, Winant 
favored past opponents in hopes of winning them over. That, McLean said, undoubtedly cooled, cooled off some of the hot enthusiasm to go out and work in the second campaign for Winant. There's no evidence in Bass's papers of this methodical effort to build momentum that carried Winant to victory in 1924. Winant, consumed with the work of the governor's office, chose to let his record speak for itself. Bass faced his own liabilities, chief, chiefly the persistent resentment among party faithful that he was the turncoat who broke the party over Teddy Roosevelt. Both men were late in laying their case before the public, relying on advertising rather than grassroots tactics, rallies, and speaking appearances. When major candidates addressed 300 Rockingham County Republicans at the Ashworth Hotel in Hampton Beach days before the primary, the union reported that Robert Moses got a standing ovation while Bass received tepid applause. This has been a most interesting campaign, Moses told the crowd. It has been largely a literary campaign, a very helpful one for the printers. <laughs> Spalding, the newspaper reported, was given an ovation second only to Moses. Winant stressed the ongoing threat of the B&M cutbacks in New Hampshire. The fight is not over, he said. <clears throat> it has just begun. The final campaign, days of the campaign had to be deeply painful as well as embarrassing to both Bass and Winant and Jim Langley too. On the Friday before the election, in keeping with that newspaper tradition of predicting outcomes, the Monitor ran these stories on its front page. Moses over Bass, Winant over Spalding. On this forecast, the Monitor Patriot will stand or fall as a prophet, the story said. It fell, <laughs> and fell quickly. The next day, the paper struck a different tone, as you can see, with these headlines. Winant, for the first time in the campaign, spoke out vigorously on behalf of Bass. While in a separate story, Winant's friend, ally, and business partner, State Senator Ben Orr, asserted that Bass would prevail on a voting day. So what happened between one day's edition and the next? The monitor was silent, but the union offered its take. The Friday meeting, Friday monitor rather, prompted a stormy meeting involving Bass, his brother, Winant and Langley, along with a few others. It was common gossip of street and hotel lobby last evening, the union reported, that the governor was told the Bass influence would be turned in favor of Spalding unless something was done to lessen the effect of the monitor's utterance. Well, as it turned out, neither man won. Bass lost by about 17,000 votes, a margin of two to one. Winant lost by 3,000 votes, much closer, but still a comfortable margin for Spalding. Moses, who was also a conquered man, outpolled Winant in the city, winning 3,000 votes to Winant's 2,700. All that was left was for Winant to assist <clears throat> in Spalding's transition into office, which he did faithfully, and prepare his ex-augural address. Traditionally, a straightforward recitation of the outgoing administration's achievements delivered the day before the inaugural. Winant turned that upside down, delivering instead what amounted to his second inaugural, so, <laughs> outlining for the incoming lawmakers his own set of recommendations for them in the upcoming session. His tone was sharp, focused on the pernicious consequences of lobbying by powerful interests, namely the B&M and the efforts of a mogul named Samuel Insull to corner the market on water-powered electricity generation from Chicago to Maine. Robert Moses, in town for the inaugural, called it the most ill-mannered exhibition I have ever seen in New Hampshire public life. The union chimed in too. From the political tombs, said an editorial, we have heard a doleful sound. <laughs> on that dissonant note, Winant brought an end to the beginning of his rise in New Hampshire politics. Of course, it was only the end of the beginning. John Winant's greatest contributions in Depression-era New Hampshire, the country, and war-torn Europe lay ahead. So did his suicide in his Pleasant Street home in 1947. But those are topics for a different night and a different speaker. 
I'm happy to fill in some details of what came later if you'd like, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So what's on your mind? <laughs> yes? Was uh, Mike Pry's book, the second part of what you were doing, was that ever published? No. No. We, um, so we started work on this in last fall, just about this time, a year ago. Um, and Mike's condition worsened over the course of the winter, and he died in April. So I only got so far, basically, as what I told you tonight. Um, Mike, who was a relentless, he, <laughs> Monique, it's fair to say, is it not, that Mike was not terribly comfortable or gifted with computers, but he was a genius at internet sleuthing. And again, in the case of Wynant, the challenge was sifting. Mike, at one point, had read every diplomatic cable that Wynant wrote during World War II. Um, he sent me a compilation of every mention of Wynant in American newspapers on the Library of Congress website, um, which alone amounted to uh, over 100 single space pages. Um, <laughs> and we knew it was a big mountain to climb, you know, but um, uh, we didn't get there. This is about as far as we got. Yes? So when do you think your book will be coming out? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an open question. So I'm not sure. Honestly, that I'll, I have the wherewithal to tackle this project on my own. Um, I have a family history project, family history written for the great grandkids I'll never know, that is um, a story only I can tell, and I intend to write that first. And on the other side of that, we'll see. It's a, it, is a, it is a remarkably compelling story. He was a remarkably complex and compelling figure. He's the subject of one biography uh, that came out in the late 60s. It's inadequate, um, in large part because um, out of deference to Constance and the family, the writer withheld a great many details about Wyden's personal life, which was not happy. Um, to his great credit, though, that um, biographer left no stone unturned in particularly in interviewing people who are long since gone, from Winston Churchill um, to Wynant's secretaries in life. Um, it's a remarkable uh, resource you know, for, for me someday or for whoever it is that picks up this story and gives it the telling it really deserves. What do you know about um, his relationship with his family? He seemed to left New York and went to St. Paul's and took off from Never there. came back. Yeah, he, um, it was strained. Um, it was a family. Arthur Coyle uh, had some interesting things to say about this when he was interviewed by that early biographer. <clears throat> he said that, you know, that it was not a close family. There was a distance between Wynant and his father. Um, and, you know, all the kids were shipped off to prep school. Um, as early as, as soon as they could. Um, and the fact that Wynant became early on a progressive, his father was a conservative, he was a real estate man, he was a conservative Republican, surely added some level of strain. Um, and sadly, Wynant seems to have repeated that pattern of behavior in his own marriage and family. Um, Constance, remember, 10 years younger, did not share his interest in public service, a public life, her primary love in life, it appears, was um, uh, breeding show dogs. And there's a photograph. Monique Pride brought a number of photographs that Mike gathered, uh, purchased, really, um, for potential use in the book. And one of them is Constance at the Westminster Dog Show with her dog who won uh, first place in the show. This was in 1944, you know, at the height of the war when John Wynant is in London. Um, so there was a distance between them. Um, and money seems to have been an issue between the two of them, too. Wynant was a, he just spent too much money. And he lost much of his fortune, it appears, in the stock market crash of 1929. And he continued to live as if he had a lot of money. 
So he spent most of the rest of his life, in fact, all of the rest of his life, in debt. Um, and it seems possible, I, haven't, I didn't confirm this um, in records, but I was told by Bill Upton, whose grandfather was another Wynant lawyer, that um, Constance may have put an allowance to protect her own wealth. She may have, put an, may have held John, her husband, to an allowance um, during his later years. It's really rather sad. There are letters in his papers from a, um, a, a faithful, longtime assistant. Uh, his last name was Toulon. Um, was with wine at the day he died, um, who basically says, I've gone without pay for some time. I loaned you $1,000 when you told me you needed money. And now I need $1,000. Is there some way you can pay me? And Bill Upton said that his understanding is that too long in the end was paid with um, furniture and things like that rather than cash. So the personal side of Wynant's life is complex and doesn't seem to have been altogether happy in his childhood and in his adult life. Yes? I'm just curious to know if you have something to say about that book that came out, what, four or five years ago? The Gentleman from London? Citizens of London. Now, I think that's a terrific book. That's a, that's a uh, wartime diplomatic history written by a woman named Lynn Olson, who um, Wynant is one of, it's either three or four characters, central characters in that book. Um, Edward R. Murrow is another, Averill Harriman is a third, I think it's the three. And she does real justice, I mean, Wynant is, shares the stage. And it's a diplomatic history, so it's not a full biography. But I think she does real justice to him and his story in that book. I, I recommend it. It's a good read. Um, did he talk much about his service in World War I and thinking about today's politicians that they served in the military? You hear everything about it. Um, well, he certainly, you know, he had his picture on his Senate campaign brochure. Right. <clears throat> and he always, you know, he's often referred to as Captain Wynant. But no, you know, aside from, aside from claiming rightly, rightfully so, um, his uh, status as a veteran of the war, he didn't talk about his exploits, he didn't tout his courage, um, you know, he, he simply said, I served. <laughs> yes? Mark, would you indulge me in making a comment and maybe asking you to expand on it? I'm fascinated by his relationship with Art Coyle. I mean, mm -hmm. Art Coyle's father was a granite cutter who died of black lung disease. Mm -hmm. His older brother worked at the uh, Girard, I think, worked for the, for the in rail yards and died early. Art ended up supporting his mother by being a clerk at a drugstore. And they lived on Clinton Street, probably, what, half a mile as a crow flies from St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. And yet when they met in the war, they became such fast friends, which yes. commented on so well. Um, yes, that's very true. Now, Arthur Coyle, as you well know, was a courageous flyer as well, who uh, was decorated for his service. I think he won the Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, he, uh, it, it, it's hard to tell. He certainly won the Croix de Guerre. Yeah. Uh, and he also, if, as you probably know, going through the, the archives at the FDR library, he tried to get, uh, he tried to get wine decorated at least once. Mm -hmm. uh, but Coyle, uh, did not have the DSC as far as I know, okay. although I think that archives at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, the Dalian Society indicate that he did, but I yeah. haven't seen it. So there's the only additional insight. I mean, clearly, Coyle knew him well. You know, he commented on, in a, in a touching way, on Winant's um, difficulty with intimacy with people. So they were very close friends, as you know, as uh, soldiers in wartime can become, right? I mean, what, what is a more, certainly an experience that brings people intensely closely together. Um, and it did persist, you know, through the ups and downs of their business. Um, I saw no indication, and you know, in that, that they had a falling out. Um, and uh, I, I believe, uh, this is somewhat conjectural on my part, but just the other night, I was reading uh, a family book, a story of John McLean, John R. McLean. It's called Judge McLean. It's written by his son. And it's largely a history of the law firm. Um, but it talks about 
the Concrete Coil Oil Company. It talks about these sorts of things. And I believe that he said in that story that having served together in France, Wynant was so understated about his own family wealth and family position that Coyle was totally unaware of it. And on the way home, when Coyle came back to this country, <clears throat> I guess he was on the way to Texas, as the story goes, um, Wynant had him stop at the family house, which was in Princeton, New Jersey, or near Princeton, New Jersey. And Coyle was stunned as they drove up this long driveway to this grand home, because he had no idea that his friend came from such wealth. Now, when, when Coyle found a promising oil field and needed money right away to, um, he didn't hesitate to wire uh, John Wynant, nor did Wynant hesitate to fund it, which was very fortunate. Yes? One of the stories, you see how uh, John has had his hand out? Yeah. There's a story that as governor, he used to, when coming to, to work, he would uh, help fellow citizens along the way. Did you pick up that? Well, that, that ha yes, I'm sure he did. Uh, I believe it. And um, this was in the sec his second term as, set of terms as governor. So <clears throat> when I said he was not quite politically entombed yet after the loss in 1926, he ran again for governor of New Hampshire in 1930. Once again, you'll probably be pleased to know with Bass's active support. And he won. And of course, that's in the Depression era. And his, he won renown for his innovative approach, um, willingness to experiment, willingness to embrace M FDR, the ultimate Democrats, New Deal proposals. And he also became uh, renowned for his personal generosity in that time. Um, it's said that he, I didn't find the original documents, but I've seen it multiple times, that he had an understanding with the Concord police that if they found someone who was jobless and homeless on the streets, they were to house them at the jail and Bill Winant for the cost. Um, so he, was, he would give his coat to people by reputation. So there was a, he's such an interesting man because he's a very self-indulgent, wealthy man who can't stop indulging himself. <laughs> but on the other hand, he is deeply empathetic and genuinely committed and concerned to helping people, not just like people in quote marks as a legislator, but people he met on the street. It's really, he's a r remarkable figure. Okay, Brian. No, along the same lines, um, I heard or read somewhere maybe up at the, the hiking trail near St. Paul's off this road that he would give out half dollars. That could be. I haven't heard that particularly, but it doesn't, nothing would surprise me, you know, in terms of his generosity. <laughs> yes, sir. I read uh, that, that book, I can't. Miss Olson book. Yes, Citizens of London, yes. And it was interesting. And then there was there's another book. Is that the one you reference uh, that left out? Yes. Uh, some so the other book that I'm aware of that focuses on him is called He Walked Alone. Yes. And it was written by Bernard Belouche in, um, I think it came out in 1968. I'm just wondering, um, is there's some conjecture that he might have been manic depressive? Mm -hmm. Do you? subscribe to that or anything? You know, seen? we can't even diagnose people's psychological illnesses in person today. Um, so I would hesitate to put any kind of label on him. But um, he did suffer from bouts of depression. He committed suicide. Um, and he worked all hours, you know, as governor of New Hampshire, as ambassador to England during World War II. He drove more methodical, disciplined people who worked with him, nuts, you know, because his work, he just, he would work all hours. And if you were his personal assistant, it put a lot of stress on you in your personal life. Um, so his behavior is certainly consistent with that. He's a very bright man, but he struggled at St. Paul's. Um, I have three, no, four quick slides. I hope you'll indulge me showing you at the very end here, because they're little nuggets that I love. But his grade, Bernard Belouche secured his grades at St. Paul, and they're in his papers. They're not good. Um, and, you know, so it's, you know, I've also heard conjecture that, well, did he suffer from a learning disability, right? Because um, how otherwise do you square these things? So 
Um, certainly, I would go so far as to say clearly, certainly struggles with mental health and well-being. Whether what, as to what specific afflictions he might or might not have had, I wouldn't venture a guess. Is yeah. There any information about how good a teacher he was at St. Paul's after leaving Princeton? He was he was beloved, and um, so Drury's instincts in hiring this dropout to teach <laughs> at this prestigious prep school were spot on. You know, uh, young men really liked him, admired him, followed him, and the one thing I've read about his teaching style was that he was more concerned with building character than he was with imparting you know, specific facts and figures. So he took very seriously this idea of your education as a formative experience and you know, forging character. So he was very well regarded within the school um, by students. And I don't know about his colleagues, but certainly Dr. Drury. Can I show you these? Yeah. These four slides there, because that. So, one of the joys for me as a newspaper person of researching newspapers, which is where I found out a lot about what transpired during that election campaign, those election campaigns, and the primary, is the nuggets you find. So, here, this is in the Concord Monitor. Remember, this is prohibition. Um, and so, this is an article on the front page of the Monitor during the session. <clears throat> about how they're going to auction off 46 cars they've seized from bootleggers. <laughs> so a bootlegger obviously faced the loss of their car and otherwise a fine, I believe. I don't think there was jail terms, at least at this point. What I love is there's a subsequent story about the auction. And you'll never guess what happened. A lot of the rum runners showed up and bought their cars back. <laughs> Why not? You had it all outfitted. <laughs> this one I love too. This is before I guess we had exterminated passenger pigeons. There's a story on the front page of the Monitor one day about this lost pigeon that is found on Main Street in Penacook in an exhausted condition. <laughs> the police officer takes him to the police station for rest and refreshment. <laughs> There's a little message, but nobody know on it, you know, attached to its leg, but nobody knows who it's for, or it's just got a code on it. They set him up, they let him go, he flies around for a few minutes, and then heads straight south. And then, two days later, no, the next day, he shows up on the steps of the Washington House in downtown, in, in Concord, is that in Concord? Yeah. Or Pentecost? Yeah. Um, apparently in great need of food and rest. <laughs> so he's given royal entertainment at the hotel, and after a rest, he flies onto a store, and then he walks around and looks confused. And that's how the story ends. <laughs> so we don't know what happened to the pigeon or the message, but I love it. And this is um, a story about that governor's ball. Uh, again, it starts on the front page of the monitor, and it is an account. It goes and fills at least one entire inside page. It's an account of what it seems like every woman who attended that ball wore that night. Starting with Constance, Mrs. John G. Winant, who wore white satin with trimmings of gold <laughs> lace. So it's such a, here's a fascinating moment because you've got, you've got women holding office. There are 14 female legislators in the 1924 session one of whom presides over the House for the first time in New Hampshire history. The men clearly don't know what to make of them. You know, the tone in the paper is sort of like these fair ladies, you know. And, um, but Wynant takes them, and Bass, take them seriously as a political force and deliberately seek out women and try to build a network of support among women. And one of the other things that I think Wynant is remarkable for is the number of women with whom he formed um, very deep, very meaningful working relationships. Um, a number of whom, at least a hint, three of them, I believe, are interviewed by this initial biographer at some length. And they came to know him very well. They took his side very much uh, versus Constance. Um, it's possible. I know Mike had a theory that he might have had an affair with one. Um, but at the very least, these were very meaningful working relationships. And I think what distinguished Winant in the eyes of these women 
is, was that he took them seriously. I mean, these women had positions of real responsibility, um, and he leaned on them. So here we are at this moment. We've got prohibition. We've got cars knocking out railroads. We've got women getting the vote um, and men trying to figure out what to make of it. And John Winant um, being someone who, both in a political sense, but I think a personal sense, um, may have been one of the first political figures to actually take women seriously. The one last thing, which you probably won't be able to read, but that's his grades one term at St. Paul's. <laughs> Somehow the biographer prevailed on the officials at St. Paul's to actually make a copy of all of his grades and give them to him. So they're in the, F if you're curious, they're in the FDR library. <laughs> Which is worth a visit. Oh, it's very much worth a visit. Have, how many of you have been to Hyde Park? Oh, more of you need to go. It's in Hyde Park, New York. It's where FDR um, lived primarily. So it's his house. There's a wonderful museum. And there's an amazing archive. You know, I mean, um, if you want to see the original Day of Infamy de Declaration of War speech, it's there. Um, on Route 9, just north of Poughkeepsie. On Route 9, just north of Poughkeepsie. There's a very inexpensive, I think it's a Days Inn, yes. like a five minute walk. And across the street from the Days Inn is this Italian restaurant <laughs> that will serve you enough food for, if you stay for a week, you go one, get one meal, you'll have enough leftovers <laughs> for the week. Don't forget, don't forget the Ever Ready Diner. And the Ever Ready Diner, which, has, uh, which is Ever Ready. Yeah. Yeah, you, we've what, been. What happened to the Abe Lincoln portrait? I, yeah, so what happened to the Abe Lincoln portrait? Very good question. I'm not sure. I found it, found this image on an auction house website from an auction in 2013, at which point it was listed as selling for between $25,000 and $35,000. Um, Winant, in that Monitor article, said his intention was to leave it to the Museum of uh, Metropolitan Art or some other facility. It's worthy of that. I mean, it was, I think it's considered one of the better portraits um, of, Wein of Lincoln as a young man. But I don't know how the, the Auction website did not list the provenance, right? It did not list the sequence of owners. Um, so I don't know what happened to it. It's quite possible that if I do return to working on this and continue reading Winant's papers, um, which contain um, uh, unvarnished details about his financial matters, that, it'll, that a sale receipt will turn up. He might have had to sell it to pay off debts. Um, I don't really know. It's a mystery. But it seems to, if I'm right, and based on the description in the paper and the name of the artist, that that is the painting, it has survived. Yes, sir? I got here a little late. What was his connection with Teddy Roosevelt? <clears throat> um, Wynant was a, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was sort of the icon of the progressive right. Republicans, um, at least until he split with the Republicans and, and ran as an independent for president. Um, and Winant was uh, uh, closely allied with New Hampshire's progressives. So um, at one point, I don't know if Teddy Roosevelt and Winant ever met, but Robert Bass was very close to Teddy Roosevelt, so Shirley apparently has men mentioned him, because Winant did carry a recommendation from Teddy Roosevelt to Europe when he crossed the Atlantic to enlist in the army. So Roosevelt was at least aware of him and wrote a recommendation for him. They were both from New York, right, originally? They were. And it also appears, again, I don't know all these relationships, but I did come across one of the investors in the oil company yeah. um, eventually is some, was a man named Thomas Barber who was affiliated with some Roosevelt. He had a Roosevelt affiliation. So um, they knew, you know, the families, uh, well, I'm sure that Wynett's family knew Roosevelt, and that may have been another point of connection. One more question. Oh, I was oh. so interested in all the names, and as you pointed out, we would all recognize them. And they're still around. They're still around. It's really remarkable. You know, I mean, John McLean, John R. McLean, Winant's lawyer and the person I've been quoting, was really the second McLean in the line of prominent McLeans. His father was a governor. 
Um, we all know Robert Bass leading to Charlie Bass. Uh, we all know the McLeans leading to the McLeans. Um, uh, or in Reno. Or in Reno. Um, and, you know, uh, someone asked me the other night, Huntley Spaulding, the name of the man he ran against in 1926, is he related to Peter Spaulding? I, I honestly don't know, but given all those connections, I, it wouldn't surprise me. You know, it's, uh, it's really remarkable. Yeah. Hey, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Now I can return the library's copy. <laughs> I didn't want to have him stay up here all night, but I'm sure he'll answer questions. I will, yes, happy to. If you have to. a personal question. And uh, don't forget that Monique Pride brought some photographs that Mike purchased to illustrate the book from later in his years, international years. Thanks for listening so attentively. Yeah. Yeah,